It is my pleasure tonight to, invite, to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Cho. And um, you're gonna, I, it's something I'm sort of secretly interested in. Um, I've always wanted to do transmagnetic stimulation. If I would have stayed in science, it's probably something I would want to do, especially with people with Parkinson's because it can help your motor symptoms and it, it gives you vigor. It helps you move with effort. And that's what you need when you practice and do your exercises. And so it would be really cool if we could like do a little stimulation out in the reception area before you come to your classes. Oops, this is... I just went red. I'm not sure, it's the, maybe the, okay, good, thank you. So yeah, it's a very interesting topic right now in part. about the transcranial magnetic stimulation for, for Parkinson's disease. So transcranial magnetic stimulation, we can also call it TMS. So any of you here heard about TMS before? Great, great. Okay, good, good. Um, uh, let, let me briefly introduce myself. I direct the brain imaging and TMS lab. I'm an assistant professor uh, in the Department of Psychology at the University of Arizona. I'm also affiliated with the Arizona Center on Aging and McKnight Brain Institute. So this is my lab, the Brain Imaging and TMS lab. In our lab, we integrate um, both magnetic resonance imaging oops, sorry, and TMS. So we integrate these two technologies for a number of purposes. Two of them I'm going to talk today is we'll, we're gonna develop image-guided TMS treatment protocols for people with Parkinson's disease and develop TMS plus MRI assessment package for people with Parkinson's disease. So why do we need to develop an image-guided TMS protocol for Parkinson's disease? As you all know, um, Parkinson's disease is char characterized by motor symptoms, including bradycanesia, tremor, postural instability, rigidity, and or gait disorder. Some people may also develop depression and or cognitive impairment. So at a very early stage of the disease, medication is very effective in maintaining a good quality of life. However, after taking medication for a number of years, people may notice that they might develop some motor complications. So for example, some people may have levodopa induced dyskinesia. So dyskinesia means involuntary movement. Um, you can observe in the body part or limbs. Some people may also develop motor fluctuation. So during the early stages, when people are taking medication, like this kinesia only occur during the top top blood level of levodopa, and off state 
only happens the like, like the later stage of when uh, the lower level of the blood level of levodopa. But when people taking medication for a number of years, the therapeutic window becomes like narrower. So that means maybe most of the time people start to feel like either dyspnea or off state. So when that happens, um, people will start to consider different stimulation. So different stimulation is a surgical procedure. It's currently the most effective treatment for Parkinson's disease. It was approved by the FDA for the treatment of Parkinson's disease in 2002. But as you can imagine, deep brain stimulation is a surgical procedure, so it's invasive. Because of that, um, actually only like later stage of people with Parkinson's disease would be recommended or when the medication doesn't work too well, would be considered for deep brain stimulation. So that means like less than 10% of people are eligible, even if it is very effective. So what are the stimulation sites? Where is the brain region that surgeon will put the electrode in the brain for stimulation? So those are the two primary regions. One is called internal global pallidus. The other is the ceramic nucleus. Why these two regions? Because those two regions are within the basal ganglia. Basal ganglia is a very deep brain region in the inside our brain. And basal gang ganglia is responsible for motor production. And those two regions, these two, they are super active in people with Parkinson's disease. So what's the consequence when they are hyperactive, those two regions? That means when this is hyperactive, it will send inhibitory signal to thalamus. So it send GABAergic signal to thalamus. So ask thalamus not to do something. And thalamus is supposed to send information to your cortex. Cortex is the place to ask you to do some movement. Because of the GPI inhibit the thalamus. So thalamus cannot ask the cortex, cortex to do something. So that's why people with Parkinson's disease have brain kinesia, have slow movement, smaller movement. So those two regions, when people receive a deep brain stimulation, Actually, the surgeon will put the electrode inside those either one of the regions and inhibit their activity. So it's very effective in improving motor symptoms. So, but you know, it's invasive. So our goal is to see if we are able to use TMS because TMS is non-invasive. If we are able to use TMS and also stimulate the basal ganglia. Hopefully, you will also improve motor symptoms in people with Parkinson's disease. So what is transcranial magnetic stimulation? It is a non-invasive brain stimulation technique. It does not require surgery, anesthesia, or sedation. So this is a photo was taken in May this year because our lab has the only one and first um, TMS at the University of Arizona. So we try to demonstrate how to use this machine to our colleagues and people in the community. Hope people are able to learn and understand the benefit of TMS. So what was the first TMS machine invented? This machine was invented in 1985 by Dr. Tony Barker. And how does that work? So this is the coil called TMS coil. So we place over the top of the head to place the, the coil over the place where we want to stimulate the brain. And the idea of TMS is based on Faraday's electromagnetic induction. So that means changes in electrical current will generate a magnetic field. Because it is magnetic, so when that magnetic field transpass your skull, it's painless. You don't feel a pain. And once it transpasses the skull, the variations in the magnetic field will induce a secondary electrical current in the brain, so around here. So if we move the, the coil here, it will stimulate somewhere there. 
So the center of the coil will have the strongest stimulation intensity. So when the like electrical current is strong enough, it actually will induce uh, electrical current and then change our brain activity underneath the coil. Because our neurons are electrochemical cells and it responds to uh, either electrical or chemical stimulation. So TNS can induce a local electric, uh, electrical current in the cortex and also elicit action potential, cause the release of chemical neurotransmitters. So what are the TNS protocols? TNS has a number of protocols. Uh, here I want to introduce the two most frequently used TMS protocols. The first one is the single pass TMS. The second one is the repetitive TMS. So the single pass TMS means when we press a button, it only gives you one stimulation pause. So like here, this is the time when we press a button. And those signals are recorded from your thumb. We actually put some electrodes over the sound region, and we are able to measure whether your sound is moving or not. And this is the measurement from the sound. So when we stimulate the primary motor cortex, that is responsible for finger movement. We can see a finger movement immediately. And this effect is very short, only lasts for like 75 milliseconds. So single pulse TMS lasts once it's finished. So it's very short. But repetitive TMS can last longer. And there are two types of repetitive TMS. First, what is repetitive? That means we can program our TMS machine to make it have a number of simulations. So we can program that as very slow, like dot, 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 dot. It's like probably one hertz. Or we can make it very high frequency, like dot, 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 this kind of simulation. So when the frequency is equal to one hertz or lower than one hertz, we call it low frequency repetitive TMS. When the frequency is equal to five or greater than five hertz, we call it high frequency RTMS. Why do we have to divide them into two different RTMS? Because they have different functions. So when we use low frequency TMS, it's actually inhibitory. That means it actually decreases the activity of your brain, brain function. When we use high frequency, it actually inside your brain. That means increase your brain activity underneath the coil. So the effect of TMS between single pulse and repetitive TMS are very different. Just like I said earlier, single pulse TMS does not last beyond the duration of stimulation. Probably only 75 to 300 milliseconds, very short. But repetitive TMS is capable of inducing longer term effects. So for example, if the person comes to the lab or comes to the clinic to receive a single repetitive TMS session, the effect can last up to one hour or 60 minutes. But if the person comes to the lab or clinic for 10 consecutive days to receive the treatment, it can last up for three months, according to previous literature. So that's why RTMS can be used as a therapeutic tool to improve function. In 2008, the FDA approved the first device using RTMS as a treatment for major depression. Uh, for those people who do not respond to at least one antidepressant medication in the current episode. And the region that is approved for depression is the area around here. Oh. Right, this is such a great question. Okay, so Tom, Tom, right? Tony, sorry, Tony is asking, where would be the best location to stimulate? And should we use high frequency or low frequency? Very good question. 
So we are definitely going to there once I describe the topic. Yes, super great question. And this is a question we actually have to submit funding, submit grant to get funding to pencils. Like which one would be the best protocol for different symptoms? Okay, so for this one, for the depression one, the region is le left dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex right here. And the approved protocol is high frequency. So do you still remember high frequency means excite, right? Increase the brain activity. Why? Why they want to increase the activity in this region? Because no. that's why brain imaging is important. Previous study found that brain imaging study found that people with depression, that region is usually um, low activity, high profile. So once they increase the activity, they observe the improvement in depression. So that's why we need brain imaging to understand, should we use uh, high frequency or low frequency? And what it would, would be the best brain region to stimulate? So we'll, we'll come, come to a best protocol for people with Parkinson's disease. And in 2013, FDA approved another device for migraine. So FDA approved the first device using single pulse CMS as treatment for migraine with aura. So people with migraine, some of them have aura, meaning that before the onset of migraine, they actually see something very bright in front of their eyes before they had headache. If you want to use, you can also move that by the fire. Oh, Can you hear me this way? <laughs> okay. So, for well, people oh, yeah. with migraine and aura, okay. people will see some uh, visual disturbances or like auditory disturbances before they have had it. So the goal of the single pulse TMS is trying to prevent the onset of migraine. Yeah, there's something wrong? Uh, okay, good. So this is, this is the TMS. The good thing about the TMS is it is portable. So people can actually bring it home and stimulate themselves. So how does that work? Um, people with migraine and visual aura, they actually found that the, the back of our head, this is our occipital region, and it's responsible for visual information. And those regions, there are hyperactive before the onset of migraine. So using the single pulse TMS, it is supposed to decrease the activity in the occipital lobe, the brain region. And people with migraine, they actually have their prescription reading in a chip, and they can insert that into that single pulse TMS machine. So once they start to see um, visual disturbance or aura, they can just put that TMS at the back of their head and press a button to stimulate themselves. So it's pretty effective, like 60% of people actually can have like 72 hours without the onset of migraine. So this is very good. So far, any questions? Uh, that's a good question. So far, we haven't seen any study. Repeat the testing. question. Okay, so um, the lady was asking question. For people who have deep brain stimulation electrode inside the brain, can they receive TMS? Uh, I think that would be, so far we don't recommend because uh, it's a magnetic stimulation. So for people who, who need to receive the TMS, they couldn't have any magnetic thing around the body. So any like um, ear cochlear or like different simulation, electro usually we don't recommend. Because we are afraid that they will increase the heat inside the electrode or move it or turn it on or off. So, so far, unless it's not magnetic. If that is good for 